What was the what was the idea that the United States must stop communism everywhere and kind of surround the Soviet Union? What was that called? Yeah, that's containment. And what and and what were they with the idea that or what two countries did Truman want money for? Yeah, Greece and Turkey. They kind of moved they Turkey really wasn't having a revolution at that time. And that led to the idea of containment and money for Greece and Turkey. This idea that communism is indivisible and ideological. What is that statement? That would become the, the basis of American foreign policy till this day. What is the basis of American foreign policy to this day? Somebody said. You know, the Truman, I would tell people to say Truman Doctrine. The Truman Doctrine, the basis. What is it called? Where one one country falls and its neighbors all fall. Yeah, that's that domino effect, domino theory. And oh, that means that every communist revolt, heck, anything we don't like is being directed from what place? Yeah, the Kremlin. That's the capital of the Soviet Union. That's capital of Russia. This big is it old or they're not church, and that's where the capital is. But at that time, it was all the evil boogeyman stall. So did we get there, National Security Act, NSA, CIA? Yeah, the great suits look bad on camera. Which actually, yeah, it's true. They all look like they're just kind of gray, alien-like things in black and white. I will show you a little bit next week about the Kennedy-Nixon debate. And you'll see it in like, oh, I see it, really see it now. But it's not in the law, but these are only spying overseas. They cannot be within the borders of the United States, technically. Okay, let's say we know, even by the letter of the law, a spy in this, or the spy agency, the KGB, it would soon be called in the Soviet Union, is contacting a spy in the United States. They can look into that communication, but not communication within the U.S., but by default, the relatively new group called the Federal Bureau of Investigation would do domestic spying. Now, domestic spying is a little bit more difficult because there has to be a search warrant. But they will find ways around that. They'll quickly find ways around that. So this is the basic elements of it. So overseas, domestic. And this is a multi-billion dollar program. And soon the FBI begins spying on Americans all over, all over the country, looking for potential enemies. And then they created a National Security Council of all the leading foreign affairs advisors, foreign affairs advisors. So basically, a council within the cabinet, like the Secretary of State, Defense, NSA, CIA head, um, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, that kind of thing but also a specific post advisor to the president called the National Security Advisor. And they're like a clearinghouse for all this intelligence from around the world will go through the NSA, the advisor, and then they will give briefings to the president. And so that person has a lot of power because the president has a number of different activities. And so they decide what the president sees. And that's going to lead to the creation of a national security state and add two words to national security state. Essentially, the United States would start to war. All the elements of total war that I went through really carefully in World War I and then referred to again in World War II, that would begin again. Presidential powers went up dramatically because the president is responsible for the FBI, the CIA, the NSA, and the Department of Defense and Department of State and everybody else. The president's power went up dramatically. Also, it acknowledged that in this new world of nuclear weapons, even though the United States was the only country to have them, have them when this law was passed, the Congress, the president won't have time to ask for a declaration of war so they could take warlike powers without going to Congress. It's no coincidence that the last time Congress would declare war would be 1942. 
You were born in war. I was born in a war. And they were undeclared. You might be thinking I was born like in the Spanish American War. No, another war. Speaking of that, there's a Vietnam War. It's implying that it's about Asia going into the United States got involved in a civil war in South Vietnam that we call the Vietnam War. There's no declaration of war. The United States was at war at two major and at least six minor ones when you were born. No declaration of war. Now, there was a logic to why they did this. Think about this new era with fleets. They, they worry about fleets of Soviet bombs flying over the Arctic to the United States. That'd be the fastest way to bomb. That's not much time to ask Congress for a declaration of war. Wait until the middle of the next decade. Intercontinental ballistic missiles. If they're fired from the Soviet Union towards the United States, how long from when they fire to when they start hitting their first targets in the United States, flying over the Arctic? How long do you have? You want to know? If Russia today fires their missiles, which are all aimed at the United States, including many aimed at Great Falls right now, how long would it take them to get it? Hmm? A little bit more time. We have a good enough 12 to 14. Two jobs. The trial to see what works. 35 minutes. There's not enough time to ask Congress for a declaration of war. China has 200 ICBMs. But they're going to triple that. U.S. has about 1,500, and U.S. has more than anything else. These are all the presidents of the Cold War. It all started here, and every single one would start using this power more and more and more. There'd be little degrees, like, for example, Jimmy Carter did not use it as much as other presidents, but still, they all used it. But here's the other big thing. You got spies. Spies can't like at the CIA, they can't walk around the Soviet Union and say, hi, I'm a spy. What's going on? Or for that matter, if we wiretap a phone, we can't tell the person we're wiretapping, hey, we're wiretapping your phone. Tell us everything you know. By definition, secret police has to be secret. And so we have a secret government a veil of secrecy is going to go over the U.S. government and a shadow separate, sometimes they call it dark or black government. Today, you might hear someone say the deep state, which is misused a lot, but that whole term of the deep state comes from this, a shadow government where they can't tell who they're spying on because they'll know. And once you have this, spying how long, how long do you suppose it would take the president to use this now multi-billion, hundreds of billions of dollars of secret government? How long would it take them to spy inside the United States? To spy on citizens of the United States? To spy on political opponents? How long do you suppose it took the president to start doing that? Anybody want to guess? Truman didn't really do it. Eisenhower did it from day one. Kennedy did it. Johnson did it. Richard Nixon would use the power of the CIA and the FBI. Using that threat and the need for this spying as an attempt to spy on and then cover up an effort to wiretap the Democratic National Committee headquarters at the Watergate Hotel. To spy on his political opponents. Eventually, that would turn into 37 count indictment we call the Watergate, Watergate scam. He would have been impeached, or he would have been impeached or probably convicted. Even Republicans would have, Republicans kind of wanted him out by then, but he resigned. And what excuse did he use? I, this is secret because the Soviets will know, our enemies will know because of the issue of they would literally, this term would come about because of this law, national security. Because of national security, we have to be in So Nixon covered up efforts to spy on political opponents or spy on the anti-war movement. J. Edgar Hoover, the head of the FBI, spied on everybody he didn't like and, and kept these large files of secret information. And people had no idea they're being spied on. 
They have now been released after what's called the 76 Church Committee, and you would not believe everybody that the FBI responded. Everybody they had a file. Everybody from mostly Democratic politicians, some Republican politicians, even musicians, uh, the court in the 1960s quarterback of an AFL team called the New York Jets. His name was Joe Namath. They had a file on him. It's actually remarkable. They just started spying on everybody for national security. Ronald Reagan, his administration would illegally sell weapons to Iran, violating three major federal laws, and they hit it for two years, national security. And President Clinton tried to hide an extramarital affair he was having through national security. President Trump tried to hide the fact that he was extorting money from the president of Ukraine, the current president of Ukraine. He was trying to say, you will not get weapons, especially anti-tank weapons, we promise you, in case of Russian attack. We won't give you that unless you give me dirt on then former Vice President Joe Biden. Those weapons would be delayed and almost certainly encourage Russia to attack Ukraine. But anyways, he tried to hide it through national security. The phone conversations came out, President Trump was impeached for that. It was just like he said, ah, those weapons. It was basically one of those nice country you have there, President Trump said. But um, didn't get the two thirds necessary to convict him. So all this is happening right now. Certainly there are secrets in the Biden administration that they're hiding and using national security. So now we have a secret government. That's why they collect your emails. Oh, sure. We don't know for exact certain because how can you know national security? But they are. There's a big uh, um, data bank of control, having millions of terabytes of uh, data in Utah. But they store everybody's emails and text messages. Yours included. They don't really look at them. They just have them. They might want to get you later. So with that, one more thing's going to come out of this too. Once you set up a national security state, you need an army. And the United States is going to do something it's never done before, build up a peacetime army by forcing young men into the armed forces, the first ever peacetime draft, the 1948 Selective Service Act. Now, it wasn't by lottery where everyone could go in World War I and World War II. It's a little more like the Civil War, where they would have local draft boards just picked by quota. And so people with political connections or wealth could get out. Usually poor people got drowned. This, the, the army would begin to be, be to be built up after demob demobilization after the war. It wasn't all that big. And by 1950, it was just starting. But they would have a little war. Korea. This would become a major issue in Vietnam, where wealthy people could, with political connections could get out of the draft. We'll talk more about that. So that is a national security state. Once this law was passed, the United States will never be the old United States. We are a country, we're imperial, and we're always at war. Your entire life would be at war, most of my life would be. It's a big, oh, this shadow government, this was a great fear of the founding fathers, why they didn't want a large standing army and wolves. Because every time you have a large standing army wars, you need spies. If you have spies, you have a shadow government. And that's what happened in England with things like the Star Chamber and stuff. So with that, even though this seemed to be very military, the largest economic, not military program of foreign affairs or foreign aid would ever happen in American history is the European Economic Recovery Act, but everybody calls it the Marshall Plan. After Truman's third Secretary of State, former head of the Armed Forces, George Marshall. And in it was the economic rebuilding of Western Europe. And the whole idea was that Europe, devastated. The U.S. tried to pull back with the realization that in the rubble or the poverty of Great Britain after the war, they might have a communist revolt. And so the decision, Truman made the decision that we must give U.S. money to Europe. Not just Europe, but add one more thing to Western Europe. Also, our occupation zone of Germany, so right down West Germany. We're going to give aid to our former enemy and 
Japan. And Japan. Countries that we went to total war and helped destroy, now we're going to help rebuild to avoid what happened after World War I. Now, conservatives wanted nothing to do with this. Conservative Democrats and most Republicans were conservative, especially foreign policy. So Truman made this part of the Cold War and said, if we don't do it, we'll be defending the shores of the United States. You're soft on communism, essentially. He asked for 48 billion, got 12 billion. That's pretty significant then for the federal budget today. Or something. Okay. Then a lot. I mean, to us, 12 billion is something. That's pocket change for us. Three years. And it's very much anti communist. And other thing was it really helped the American economy. When you're trying to rebuild, this is London after the war. London was bombed and devastated. And then that's Berlin in 1948. That's still part of Berlin. Berlin was still rubble. Where are you going to get the, the supplies to rebuild Europe? The U.S. So this would be a boom to the United States economy. Much of that money will come back. But at this point, it was incredibly successful. This would trigger in 15 years what we call the European miracle. We got that. It's called the European miracle. This rebuilding of the European economy, especially West Germany. It's going to be kind of a, a cool thing. Not the most popular, but the cool thing to drive German cars. One approved by Hitler called the Volkswagen. So with that, we're going to jump right to this. It's no coincidence that once we decide we're going to have to start rebuilding Western Europe, we got to do something about the occupation zones of Germany. They didn't have a set currency, they didn't have a set economy, there wasn't a set government. And so they couldn't make a deal with the Soviets. So in 48, France, Britain, UK, and the US decided to make a common currency. It's gonna be called the Deutschmark, mark, which will be German currency until 19, uh, 2022. That's what I'm sorry, 2002, 2002. Now here's the thing. They were using what's called occupation script. They didn't have an economic, you can't really have an economy. You can't have a tax system. You can't have local government. It's without a currency. <laughs> but with a currency, that means you need a central bank. You need laws. You need rules. You need a government. And so even though they didn't say it, everybody knew what this was. You create a common currency. You cannot have a financial system unless you have a government to make the rules. So they're going to create a new country, which will become the next year, West Germany. When I was your age, it was West Germany and East Germany. And the capital of West Germany is going to be this little tiny town on the Rhine River called Bonn. And they put it in this little tiny town with the idea being, we're always going to go back. We're going to unify and go back to Berlin. That's going to be really weird. Bonn is this tiny town. And it's got all these massive government buildings from when it was the capital of a very rich and powerful country. And they're mostly just empty. It's kind of weird. And so they're all kept very well by the Germans because that's what Germans do. And it's, they're empty. Stalin was furious. He was upset about cutting off aid, about reparations. As he saw the United States was trying to isolate them, threatening war, the U.S. had nuclear weapons. And he's and claiming that the Soviets were the threat. And then this was the last straw. This was the last straw. So in response, here's Berlin. French, British, American occupation sites. Each of them had an airfield they could use. And then a corridor, and along this corridor was an autobahn, a road, a railroad. And it was just basically for supply issues and then you know, this is designated for the Americans to resupply their sector. What he did is he cut them off. He ordered his soldiers to blockade the land routes, saying they need to repair it, which was not 100% false. But they cut them off, basically going to starve not just the Allied troops, not the Soviets. Well, are you going to take that? Do we have a fight? No. So with that, 
they cut off these rocks. Now, this, to many in the West thought, this was an effort by the Soviets to grab West Berlin, and they're going to try to get the rest later. Now, I understand why especially Germans would be very scared. But this was a very defensive and paranoid act by Stalin. But he's giving the, the United States, Britain, and France a basic question. Keep Berlin or keep West Germany, you can't have both. You can't have both. And here are Berliners watching this say British plane coming in. And here is a cartoon showing them blockade. But this also shows how the Allies did this. Now, Truman does not want World War III. We don't have the army. That, our army is demobilized. We have nuclear weapons, but does you re, do you really want World War III? And how many Americans wanted to go fight for Berlin after they were just our mortal enemies three years earlier? So Truman and Attlee, the, chair, the Prime Minister of Britain, came up with an airlift. They're going to use mostly American and British planes. The American Air Force was significantly bigger, but also the British Air Force. There were some French planes, but remember, France is still kind of rebuilding after the war. And they're going to bring in supplies, not just to the occupying armies, but to the almost 2 million Berliners that lived in their occupation zones. Mostly the elderly, young women and children. It was very few young. And why? For the war. And I like this cartoon, one of the famous ones of Stalin as the Russian mayor squeezing it off. And I love this picture of the Berliners on a pile of rubble watching the plane come in the temple off air too. And my sister-in-law, my wife's sister married a guy from Berlin. He grew up in the Temple Hop region in the American occupations. So when he was a kid, he was still right there at Temple Hop. They have a big new international airport, so now it's like a big area that everyone goes walks for the dog. It's actually really the old airfield that's it's kind of cool, right in the middle of town, but for 10 months. And after after about two months of really all kinds of traffic jams and problems, they really begin to organize this airlift. And basically, it's just a continuous ribbon of planes, they call it. Came in, dropped the goods off, flew back. The planes are pretty small then, really expensive. And the biggest thing was not the food. They brought in food. They were on almost starvation rations, but they got food. It was the coal the heat to the town during the cold winter. That took up so much room. But after a few months, it began to work. And one more thing it did, the election of 1948 is coming up. And Truman could look tough on communism without looking like a maniac starting World War III. He could look tough. I'm not backing down, but we're not blowing the world up. But this is the first time Americans really saw that the Cold War has begun. Oh. So British and American pilots begin to bring chocolate and other candy, and they would drop them, even made little parachutes, and they would drop them to Berlin with kids. Here are these kids waiting. And, and I remember talking to, so my brother-in-law's father, he was a little kid. He, he, he was born just when World War II was ending. So he was like four. But he can remember this. Remember, like gathering up little parachutes or like little tiny bits of uh, little um, baggies of Hershey's chocolate. I was like, wow, you didn't have anything. And that little bit of chocolate. The Germans still hated the occupying armies, but this is going to be this is going to be looked at by the uh, Germans as okay, they're still occupying, but they're not protecting us from the Soviets. And this was a big deal. And it was very successful. Even evacuating children who were in need of aid. Okay, I was, there was a very famous picture. I couldn't find it, but I found a crow, a raven calling a baby. So I thought I'd show you that one instead. So we used ravens to save babies and so they could be better cared for. Okay, that's actually kind of scary. Stalin backed it. And with that, it would be a victory for Truman. Oh, these are American companies advertising their role in the Berlin airlift. But once this happened, both sides made this, this big step. The Cold War is here and they can't, they can't back down, neither side. Stalin, by blockading, can't go back. And he's going to create East Germany. 
and the United States canceled us. And domestically, politically, no American president could ever go back from this. And so this is like the last straw. But you can imagine some companies made a lot of money, like Boeing Airlines, making a big transport plane called the C-97. And the 1949, then the United States is going to create NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And this is, make sure we get this down, a military alliance. I know it says treaty, and treaty might sound like, oh, they're going to make peace. No, this is a military alliance to counter the Soviet Union. Everyone got that? A military alliance to counter the Soviet Union. And it's going to involve you know, the big United States and Canada, but you know, Britain, France. But add one more thing. Eventually, the new West Germany will join. And soon the United States will allow West Germany to rearm, and they will soon drop over a million man army. In fact, Germany kept the draft going until 2011. Now they basically totally demobilized because. Yeah. And after Stalin died, the Soviet Union would counter, including East Germany, with their own military alliance called the Warsaw Pact. And you notice it's Warsaw. Warsaw implied it's not a Soviet alliance, it's all these communist countries acting together. Warsaw is the capital of what country? Yeah, Poland. I know it's Poland and Ireland, but it's capital of Poland. Which, by the way, was still Rome. Oh, Warsaw was black. Germans destroyed Poland. If you go to Warsaw today and see the buildings, they were rebuilt on the foundations of old buildings. It was destroyed. It still was ruined. But Poland went through, through in World War II. Unbelievable. And this military, Warsaw Pact would end in 1990 with the Cold War ending. But NATO's still there. NATO's still there. Poland is now a member of NATO. And even though this is kind of garbage, one of the reasons Russia would give us an excuse to invade Ukraine was that Ukraine might join NATO. And ironically, a neutral country, two neutral countries, one of them just joined NATO, said so they would never join until the Russians invaded Ukraine. But Finland just joined NATO. That's become kind of a military alliance against Russia. Well, Russia, weak, poor country. Nuclear weapons. Sweden is trying to get them. Sweden was always neutral. So, a couple more things. The post war world economy will be triggered at a place called Bretton Woods. And this was actually a meeting in 1944. Bretton Woods is a resort near the Finger Lakes in New York. I've never been there. That's the sun that's been there. I took that sign from somebody else. I want to go. I guess it's beautiful. Upstate New York is really beautiful. And when I was there, I actually kind of wanted to go there. But you know, you, you have limited time to travel. You pick and choose where you're going to go. But these are economic and financial leaders from all over the world. But you can imagine the United States dominated. And they were, they knew that the worldwide financial system is going to be in tatters because of the war. So they created a stable world financial system where all currencies outside the Soviet Union are going to be paid to the United States dollar, based to that dollar, and all paid to it. Now, the problems with this, but since the United States was so overwhelmingly powerful at that time, the U.S. economy after the war was bigger than the rest of the world's economy combined. That's how much wealth the United States had. Trust me, the United States does not have near that wealth now, even though the United States is still incredibly wealthy. It's also going to be that the U.S. dollar would be based on gold. Now, there's lots of problems with the gold standard as they found out during the Great Depression. But the thought was it would pay it at that, and therefore everybody could reestablish their currency. And this would lead to a relatively stable economy. And everyone agreed to basically liberal or Keynesian economics. And it promoted in Western Europe and Japan social democracy. And social democracy is using some socialist ideas to stabilize the economy so fascism doesn't come back. What's, what are socialist ideas? What's the old age pension in the United States passed during the New Deal? Yeah, Social Security. Or things like the U.S. never did get this, but 
every other country did it. National health insurance or free or incredibly low cost college or other aid like that, like um, making sure that people have a guaranteed vacation time and uh, at least some you know, housing subsidies, things like that. That never really happened here. We do not have national public insurance at all. And we do not have guaranteed vacations. There's no guaranteed vacations. But it's a paid parental leave. So when you have a child, parent will can stay with the child and get paid. We do not have an income at all like that in the United States. Oh, you can take A, but you don't get paid. That's not now. You might get a job where you sign a contract and you get something like that, but that's not going to be in like Germany. It's in Japan. It's in Germany is two years. They also get like a doctor or a nurse will come two times a week. First two years of the pregnancy to help you out. Help you out. This is in the like statement. Same exact thing happens, yeah. They do it for people who don't live there. So, happened to my sister in law, even though she's still an American citizen, she's an official resident. That it was really, really nice. I, I, I'm not around little kids. They're small and they scare me. But as I understand, actually, um, it's kind of difficult. That's what I've heard. People have told me. Have you been around little kids? They're terrifying. I'm afraid they'll break. I don't. And now I'm old. But 1970s, it would start to go away. The rise of conservatism, or another term for conservative economics, will be called neoliberalism. I know that goes against what FDR called Keynesian or liberal economics. It, remember, that's only for the US, but neoliberalism is conservative economics. And this began to fall apart. Also, in 71, the US went off the gold standard. Neoliberalism is conservative economics. And just with a different name. And every president in your lifetime has been neoliberal in some way. President Biden is probably the least in your lifetime. President Obama was very conservative. President Trump was very, very conservative. President Bush was very, very conservative. Clinton was very conservative. So that's Bretton Woods. So let's get a little bit of the post-war United States really quick. Post-war United States. Now, one thing. There was a real problem as the war. Remember, there was a big economic depression and all the millions of men came home without jobs. And it led to that unemployment. We had the Red Scare. To avoid that, the Roosevelt administration, and this was mostly uh, liberal, economically liberal Democrats, Keynesian Democrats, got the GI Bill. Remember, they couldn't get low or very low or free tuition for state universities. But they got it for soldiers. They passed it over conservative, mostly Republican, but also Southern conservative Democrats. But they got it passed, just barely. And the GI Bill provided college, at least some of college tuition for veterans. And we got that for veterans. And also aid for buying a home, homeowners insurance. So here we got homes and college. And Black veterans were excluded some, but they still benefited greatly. And think about it, there's going to be almost 15 million veterans by 1947. So many of those will be able to go to college that they never would have been able to do. And they could go to college paid for by the GI Bill. And this would help fuel the economic growth of the 1950s and 1960s. Think about this well-educated group of young men and women able to adapt to the new and changing economy. And this is one of the big things about the armed forces today. That's the big benefit. It's the GI Bill back from the New Deal. You know, that, that's, we didn't get college aid for everybody, but this is a huge hunk. In fact, I was just talking to uh, Mr. Long, talking about his dad, who was the same one I told you about was in Berlin, got back from college with the GI Bill. My my cousin who went to the uh, Marines after he graduated from high school, he graduated from college with the GI Bill. Most people I know today, when they think about going to the military, one of the big reasons, the GI Bill. I don't know if you know this, but college is expensive. Did you know that? 
folks, it's a hell of an eight year commitment, but still it's a it's a commitment, but that's why a lot of people do it. But this could still be a post-war depression. There's still, it's not near as bad as after World War One, but there'll still be inflation. There'll be a lot of problems as post-war depression. Here is uh, Truman addressing Congress in 1946. And because Republicans swept the 46 midterms and because of this post-war depression, it's just higher than the war. Okay. We'll finish this tomorrow. Oh, I almost forgot. Tomorrow, I told you this last week. Brainstorm and outline. The event leading up to the revolutionary. War. Yeah, we're reviewing now for the AP exam. But you have your notes, but also the review packet, right? And you have to do anything, any events from, you know, the events leading up to the Revolutionary War. They don't have to be things you use in the essay, just as many events in that era. So you talk about the French and Indian War, you know, the Stamp Act, George Washington, the Declaration of Independence. Has everyone got that? No, no, you're, you're going to do it in class. You're going to sit down, and you're going to write down a brainstorm list of 50 things, and I'm going to give you an essay question. You have to write a thesis. So you're going to have to do a little review. It's time to start reviewing. Thesis, or the thesis. Just a thesis. There's a time limit. 38 seconds. Does that seem short? Okay, I'll give you five minutes. Now, doesn't five minutes seem like a long time compared to 38 seconds? See it. Come on. Yeah, just go. Read my presence. Thank you. See ya. Goodbye. Unless you're Van Gogh shirt. So you guys do the test, you do it like on Monday. Okay. Okay. Not, it's not necessarily a pension, but you get like an additional money if you're deployed overseas. And it, that wasn't in the original GI Bill, but that was passed during the Obama administration. They had a little bit of soldiers who were yeah. And it, it, it's just basically a, a, like a financial benefit. Yeah. See you tomorrow. That sounds great. That would be a good question to get. Yeah, here. You know, of course, who knows? Right. Okay, tomorrow. Yes. We're going to do a brainstorm and thesis on the uh, events leading to the revolutionary war. Start the review. Okay. So just go back, like stamp backs. Yeah, like that. all the stuff, French and Indian War, on to, right. you can, and the brainstorm list, you can have everything up to the end of the week. Right. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, why not? Why not? Do what's going to happen. Uh, do it like, what, I'll have a little bit of Yeah, exactly. First rate, stamp backs, TI. All oh, yeah. perfect. And just a piece, it's we're just starting to go back and review. Okay. Great. Thank you. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. I knew it. It's said it's gonna snow. It's snowing. Thank you. That's one of our favorite or few plants.
things go out of the way things go. All done with the ACT? Yep. Good. Go to another one. Do they give you a little extra time in on that? Yeah, yeah, they give you like, uh, that's good. 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 That's good.